My name is Matt. Welcome back to the shop. Uh, right, let's just get on with it. Let's get really technical. Let's get on with it. I'm a fully grown human of average build and average strength. This is a tiny 125cc scooter engine that I cut in half. It is exactly 16 times. It's a bit of a crude cut in it. He also says it's. Um, he, let me go back a second. He says. Tiny 125cc scooter engine that I cut in half, it is exactly 16 times smaller than a 2 liter 4 cylinder car engine. And now I'm going to use my average I don't matters, but yeah, whatever. strength to try and open the valves of this engine. And although I am definitely able to do it, it takes a considerable amount of strength and effort to open the valve. Right, it so number one is you're grabbing a sprocket that's been, been to be driven by a chain not your hand. Number two is you are a meat puppet. So humans are specifically, particularly strong. It's like saying, I'm an average sized guy. I cannot move this house. Oh, okay. I don't see the relevance. <laughs> Take strength because to open the valve, I must compress the valve spring. I must overcome the resistance of the valve spring. Overcome the resistance of the valve spring. Uh, you've got to overcome the inertia of the system, so you've got to accelerate the valve, yes. Uh, you've got to overcome the spring force, the, the pre-compression of the spring, yes. Boom. The work and energy I put into compressing the Oh, work and energy. Be careful what you say there, but yeah spring is then stored in the spring yeah. and once the camshaft lobe moves away the spring decompresses yeah. and snaps the valve shut right, now right, i right, yeah. did this just a few times and i already feel strain in my hand but you put a handle on that a crank handle something that's designed for humans and you'll go this is fine now yes you're increasing the leverage but this is that system is dependent on how strong people are. So you put a small little lever on it, you go, oh God, that's quite hard. But then you get a massive guy who's really strong. He goes, that's, that's easy, I don't see a problem. So the scalability of forces is dependent on whoever you choose. Get a long breaker bar and give it to a five-year-old. They're not going to be able to do it. You've... In other words, what I'm trying to say is like, I'm an average guy. I can't, you know, it's it's hard to do these valves. What does that mean? I'm an average guy. This 16-ton boulder, I cannot move. But this giant crane can. I don't understand, like, our engines... <laughs> is it... Would an engine being able to crank over by a hand grabbing a sprocket like that, the average person, be a good thing? I don't understand the point here. Like, crank the engine over, grab that crank and turn that whole thing. You're like, God, there's a lot of friction in this. It's like, hmm, yes. <laughs> but the engine, when running, has to do this thousands of times every minute because we must open both the intake and the exhaust valve during every full combustion cycle to get air in and out of the engine, which means that to keep operating, to open the valves, the engine must consume some of the work that it does. It must consume some of the energy that it has. using work and energy all over the place. Harnesses from combustion. In other words, the valve train is reducing the power output and the efficiency of the engine. But the, almost the same thing. But OK, how much? So we're going through this avenue of how much again. So, let's go and have a look. I've already watched this video, so I kind of know what's coming. Um, so, energy losses. Right, if we look at the losses, pumping losses and so forth for an engine, I know these ones are pretty good. Uh, actual data from graphs. Come on. What are we waiting for? There we go. So, if you look at these, right, there's loads of them, different types. There's a good one. Can I make this bigger in bigger than this? Oh, I can't. The stock image is just the size of the image is. Um, open a new tab. Oh, for God's sake. Can I make that big? Yes, I can. Right. So what we've got here, we've got friction mean effective pressure. 
um, and then we've got speed from 0, 3,000 to 6,000 RPM, uh, about normal. And then what we've got, we've got camshaft bearings, and you can see that all of these frictions go up with speed, right? usually with the square of the speed, um, or velocity, if you want to put it that way. So crankshaft bearings, that much. And as you see, the crankshaft bearings compared to some of these, if you look at, just say, the purple one there, the piston rings, that goes from down here to up here. It's a big, massive increase. You know what I mean? It basically doubles. Um, but crankshaft bearings don't, and this is why we use hydrodynamic bearings. Same with conrods. Pistons, so that's the friction of the piston itself. Piston rings. Valve train is the green one. Oil pump is the yellow one. Water pump is the light orange one. And the generator is the orange one. So as you can see, right, if you take the generator and the water pump, they are more than the valve train. The entire valve train. Valve train. So the whole thing. The train. So all the sprockets, the cams, rubbing in the bearings, springs, tappets, lifters. Now it doesn't tell you exactly what engine this is. Probably from the paper it does. But you see what I'm saying. It, your oil pump, right, is a hell of a lot more. Your piston rings, your piston assembly is a massive part. And you can tell. Like it does. Turn that. Now pump up and down your piston by hand. You're like, oh my god. Without the leverage, just grab the piston, con just grab the conrod, and just go up and down. You're like, holy shit, that's a lot of effort. And that's one, that's one cylinder. And you don't have to take this as gospel. They're all about the same. This one has piston group, valve train, crankshaft seals, and timing drive. You can see the piston group is a lot more. The piston group is a lot more. It always is. Right? It always is. So you can you can click on loads of these and you can have a look. It depends what study someone did, but they're all about the same. Right? Here's another one. Oh god, a tiny image. What a shame. Um they're all about the same. When you look at all of these, uh the pumping losses pumping losses is another one. Uh pumping losses, auxiliaries, valve train, there's another one there, this one. Oh, that's the big best image in it. It's always goes to these small images. Uh crankshaft. Pistons are huge, valve trains, auxiliaries, and pumping ish, uh, pumping losses. You can see that the valve train... So, it is a thing. What matters is how much of a thing is it. This one here... Oh, God. But that has loads of them. And if you actually look in here, um, you'll notice that they're all about friction. And it's because when you compress a valve spring, like he showed, when you compress a valve spring... If you get to the top, right, to the right, the nose of the cam, the highest lift, and then let go, it the the spring forces back out and it turns the cam the, the crankshaft. So it's putting energy back into the system where it came from. Rotation into compression of a valve spring, the valve spring pushes that back out and rotates the cam. That is where the energy was originally. And that camshaft is connected to the crankshaft. So it's all a rotating assembly. So when you apply load to your rear wheel, it's supping energy from the whole system, right? Camshafts included. It's all part of the rotational inertial mass, right? It's all part of it. So he seems to think that because it's hard to squash a spring, that's lost energy. But when you do this, right, if it pushes back out, that's the reverse of what you did. That's a reversible process. Like a piston, it squashes the air, but the air pushes back down. That's a reversible process. Energy loss is where it pisses off and you can't get it back. For instance, if you squash a cylinder, heat is generated. That heat can just leak out. In, in, into the, It heats up the piston. A hot piston is now not helping it move. You know, a hot piston, if you get a, piss, a cold piston on a bench and a hot one, and you heat well, two pistons, you heat one piston, that hot piston isn't going any faster unless you put it in your hands and you chuck it because it's really hot. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so his point about how much energy is lost, it's the friction that matters. So this is the other thing. An engine running, let's just say the valve train is about 10%, right, or 25%. And a lot of people have said it's 25%. 
It's 25% of not energy, not engine consumption. It's 25% of the friction, right? So how much is the friction robbing of an engine? So let's just say, just say a 10 horsepower engine. Let's just guess and say the friction losses in this engine are one horsepower, a tenth, right? It is a quarter of that tenth. So it's a 40th, right? It's a 40th of the engine's losses, uh, engine's power output. So if you were to recover that, and you and he goes on to talk about rotary valves, that's if you recover off all of it. So these things, it matters what we're talking about here. Now, a gains are gains, right? But it depends what those gains cost you. And that is a really bad cut, man. Come on. We don't really have a choice. Four-stroke engines, which is what 99... Like that friction there is a lot more than the valve train. Yeah. ...percent of the engines on the road are, they need to let air in during intake. Yeah. The combustion chamber must be sealed during compression and combustion. And we must let air out during exhaust. This... I wouldn't call it air anymore. Like I wouldn't call... You don't call smoke air. I breathe smoke. I breathe air. You know, when you say fresh air and you breathe air. Now, the atoms and all the rest of it are just the same. They're just the, the chemistry is just different. You know, you've got carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, a lot of water. Some some oxygen still left in there a bit, and a lot of nitrogen, and then nitrous oxides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you wouldn't call that air. You wouldn't want to breathe that. And you know, what we call air is very specific. It's twenty about 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen, with some trace bits and pieces in there. That what is what we define air as. This is a bottle of air, this is a bottle of nitrogen, that's a bottle of exhaust gases. It's just weird to call it air, but whatever, it's fine. This means that we need a system capable of sealing and unsealing the chamber thousands of times per minute while at the same time withstanding the incredibly harsh conditions present inside the combustion chamber. And that's that bit is co completely right. Yep. That's exactly what poppet valves like this one actually do. They are great at sealing because the conical shape of the valve face fits into the conical shape of the valve seat and to get it's not entirely just that though is it there's, there's there's one thing he doesn't mention about the angle of valve seats which is also important to how they work um but the reason why valves uh, poppet valves work so well is not just because of the angle you could have it just a, a flat surface against so basically you could just have it a flat surface against a flat surface it would also seal. The angles are there to help it um, centralize. So you could literally have a, you know, a cylinder head like this with a valve stem, you know, with a valve like this, and then, and, you know, you'd have a, a, a port there. Kind of, oh, no, sorry. It, a very cool drawing because I'm going to be quick. But, you know, you have a port here like this, and as long as this seat overlaps, you could have it like that. It would be fine. It it would work. It could jam up, etc., etc. And we'll get to that in a minute because the, there are some benefits to the system, like I just mentioned. But one of the major things about, and I don't know if you mentioned, I can't remember if you mentions it. One of the major things about valves is that they are actively closed, so they are pulled closed by the spring. Better they create what's known as a positive seal. They're also both made out of hardened metal. The positive seal bit, I don't think he understands what that word means. The positive seal bit is the fact that it's actively forced against its seat, right? It's not just like closing a door and a little latch comes out and it's just basically floating there and the latch just stops it being blown open. It is actively closed. It's like leaning a bookshelf against a door to keep it closed, to keep it against the door frame. You know what I mean? So there's, there's there's two different ways there. So if you go to push it, you can't open it, that kind of stuff. Those which offer impressive resistance to wear and increased temperature. And as combustion pressure acts on the valve head, it actually pushes it harder against the countersunk seat. That's so just for the compression, uh, for, the, for combustion from the power stroke. In the other strokes, i.e. when you go down for the intake, 
the intake valve opens, but you wouldn't want the exhaust valve opening either, right? Because the pressure inside the exhaust is higher than it is in the intake because you're trying to draw a, a vacuum or lower than gauge pressure. So because of that, um, you want the, the valve to be actively, to actively seat against the valve. The other thing as well is the um, elastic collision between valves and seats. In other words, the seat will bounce. You close it and it, it'll bounce off the, you know, so how do I do this? Well, yeah, it's just there's the seat just saying, here's the valve coming in, and it will bounce. Bam, 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 bam. It'll bounce off it, like a, a ball bearing bouncing off a steel workbench. So you want the valve to seat and, and positive, you know, all of that shock and any of that bounce be drawn in by the spring under the, the spring pressure. So that's what matters as well. The greater the pressure, the better the seal. Unfortunately, other than being great at sealing, the poppet valve has no other inherent advantages. Well, you've you just missed loads of them. The other thing as well is the fact that it's round. We've been through this before in some of my other videos, but valves are round for a good reason. Um, and it's because they've got a self-cleaning action. They rotate and literally clean the surface, just like you would lap, but with no, you know, so anything that's sat on there, a bit of carbon or whatever, it basically just gets pulverized and scraped off. The valve, the rotating valve also helps to keep the valve seat concentric and to keep the valve concentric. In other words, they're always wearing in a circular pattern. It's like a, if you want to think about it, it's like a very slow lathe over time. And you do this thousands, billions of times, then you're going to keep the concentricity and the circular shape of your valve. It's going to stay a perfect circle. So that's also a good thing. This is why valves are not... Um, keyed they're not restrained from rotating the rotation is a good thing and a lot of people see videos and he does it in this video show you videos of valves rotating and people seem to think that's a bad thing that's an actual real good thing that's a, a good that's why it's not stopped from happening you could even say that from an engineering perspective this is just a necessary evil that we worked around with decades of technological advancement right so the, what is about to go on now is in basic principle it seems correct but in reality it's nonsense so we'll go through what he's about to say the first thing that we had to solve is to get valve seats to even last a reasonable amount Back in the 50s and 60s, the only way we could get valve seats to not fail very quickly was to put lead in the fuel. What so, this is all nonsense, right? This is all nonsense. It said, it said back in the 50s and 60s, we put lead in fuel to stop valve seats from failing. This is bollocks reasons why we had avoided fuel was not just to prevent knock in the engine. No, 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 no. Right. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I have a, 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 well, actually, this is from a, a book and this was published by Cambridge University Press, right? This is, um, actually, no, this is a, a, an, an abstract from um, The Birth of Kettering Doctrine, uh, f <laughs> Fordism, Sloanism and the discovery of tetraethyl lead. So TEL is what they put in fuel. Now, they want me to pay for this, but I found another source. So I'll get rid of that now. So in here, this is um, basically a, a, about, so it's about lead. It's about um, the early research on engine knock in 1916 and 1918. Um, and then tetra tetraethyl lead discovery the troubles with tetraethyl lead. So, and then early one is about poisoning, so on and so on. So, um, I'll just I'll just read all of this out because this is really quite interesting, all right? So, remember what he said. In the 1950s, lead was added to, uh, to protect valve seats. That's number one. Number two is, it wasn't just, you know, it, the knock thing, meh, right? Um, so, Midgley... Uh, Midgley is quite famous for, um, he discovered tetraethyl lead and he also discovered CFCs and then he died of polio, I think. Um, there he is, Thomas Midgley, Thomas Midgley uh, not the, the village. So he is a mechanical and chemical engineer 
he played a major role in discovering uh, leaded gasoline, tetraethyl lead, and some of the first uh, f- uh, chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. And um, yeah, so brilliant chemist. Environmentally, <laughs> it's like the Antichrist. Any road. Let me read this bit. So it says, For many years after tetraethyl lead was discovered, alcohol and benzene blends were considered much more reliable anti-knock agents. Naval tests in 1923 provided very satisfactory results with a 30% alcohol blend in gasoline that would soon take the place of gasoline altogether. A Naval Advisory Committee report said in 1925 noted that the anti-knock values of alcohol gasoline blends so everyone talking about ethanol being a modern thing no you're miles off (laughs) Uh, it cautioned that the alcohol might reduce the amount of food products and its economical soundness is an is open to question so what they're talking about is if we start putting a lot of ethanol or just run ethanol engines full stop what would that do to the um, food production? Because they need to grow the crops to make the ethanol. So they were talking about the the idea of that. But also noted that ethanol from vegetation was a renewable resource and in an emergency could be produced in unlimited quantities. Midgley, uh, the guy, you know, CFC boy, also trusted alcohol benzene blends more than tetraethyl lead. He confidentially advised U.S. Navy flyers attempting to cross Pacific flights not to use an ethyl-leaded gasoline, which had only begun to be marketed. Hmm, weird. Weird that the guy, Midgley, who discovered TEL, he said, quote, We have made great uh, progress in overcoming the spark plug and valve trouble caused by ethyl-lead. Sorry, what? The... Spark plug and valve trouble, okay, caused by lead. Um, but we have not yet solved the problem to our entire satisf- satisf- satisfaction. And in view of the fact that it is essential, essential that no engine trouble of any kind developed, it seemed wise not to risk the use of this material. Probably the best probabilities are offered by a fuel consisting of a gasoline gasoline benzol alcohol blend oh troubles continue to test Kettering and Mid- uh, midgley commit commit <laughs> commitment <laughs> troubles continue to test Kettering and midgley's commitment to tethethyl lead in the 1922 to 23 period the compound was extremely hard to make and it broke down quickly in sunlight engine tests showed that particles of lead burned holes in the exhaust system and valve seats oh lead <laughs> lead oxide also caked the spark plug stopping the engine after a few hundred miles there was also the problem of how to physically deliver a dangerous additive to the gasoline market midgley believed that all the problems could be overcome tetraethyl lead would be kept in light tight containers <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny way of saying it. Valve seats and exhaust pipes will be made up with much harder alloys. Reactive lead particles could be neutralised with the addition of chemical agents. For example, an acid or radical that could combine with lead, such as chlorine, sulphur, selenium or bromide. We have, uh, we may hope to be all, almost any time to find a sufficiently satisfactory solution to the problem so that the initial marketing at least may be started. It, and it just goes on where it says, Originally delivered methods was to sell a pill made of tetraethyl lead and a waxy substance that would dissolve in gasoline. A pattern was applied in 1922, the basic concept, uh, but the pills to turn water into gasoline and other uh, fraudulent schemes was made made the public wary of such approaches. Almost sounds like um, you know all the other stupid, what's it called, um, you know, you put all these methanol stupid uh, the 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 tin things. You know the what was it called? The gasoline things where you drop it in and it does all this rubbish. It sounds like those things were happening even back then. This the pill that turns water into gasoline and other fraudulent schemes. So obviously that was going on quite a lot. Um, 
Well, it was awarded in 1922 with a prestigious medal in the New York Chemistry Society. Um, it released the honours in 19 blah blah blah. And then it goes on to say in all of this, if you read this through, about when... Um, so there, there were two workers on the assembly line packing the bottles of this additive uh, of tetraethyl lead died uh, in April 1924 and the line was shut down. So they were producing this stuff in 1924. What do you mean the 1960s? The 50s and 60s? It says here, by September there, by September 1923, 100 gallons per day of operation were in full production. So they're the, 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 the selling this stuff, right? The, the, the selling this stuff in the 1920s. That's not the 1950s, is it? In the pub, public controversy, lead poisoning deaths of the first works in Daytona, Ohio and Deepwater, New Jersey had not attracted attention. But when the first standard oil company workers died in 1924, they basically said it was lead and they started going off on one. When they started to look for alternatives, all right, so they're looking for new anti knock compounds. It's got nothing to do with valve seats. Valve seats were actually initially a problem because of lead. This is what happens when you don't know your own history that you're talking about. When you don't know what's going on and you just read Wikipedia. If it's not in Wikipedia, you miss this stuff. It was also to prevent valve seat failure. It protected the valve seats because the intense hammering of the valve face against... So what happened was, this is what really happened, is that manufacturers use certain alloys and later on in later engine development when they're running hotter temperatures, water cooling, etc, etc, getting more horsepower out of engines. So then what happened was they picked certain alloys that during testing passed because they were using leaded fuels. When they then went to unleaded, they found that some of the alloys required the lead in the combustion process to cool the valves. So the valve seats were actually overheating and getting hammered. Right? That was one of the problems. And the, the, the tetraethyl lead, in a sense, cools the combustion to stop. That's how its anti knock characteristics work. As soon as they switched to unleaded, some valve seat materials were getting hammered to pieces and prematurely failing, not failing instantly, just prematurely failing. So they had to change the alloys. This whole thing is it was a broad sweep across every single car manufacturer, bike and all the rest of it, is absolute nonsense. It's a myth that's propagated. It's the valve seat under very high temperatures would lead to micro welds between the face and the seat. Depending on what valve seat and what valves you what you make your valve faces and your valve seats out of, and it wasn't across the board. As the valve opened again, these micro welds would tear, eventually leading to valve seat recession. Which right. is valve seat recession <laughs> is not what he thinks it is. Valve seat recession is when the valve seat gets hammered into the head. The head is aluminium, and depending how you design that. The, depending how you design this seat, a lot of the times there's not much material behind the seat. If we look at a cross section of a cylinder head, depending on how you have designed the system, uh, cylinder head cross section, depending on how much meat there is behind it, can really affect what's going on. So there was, oh, I've zoomed in here, aren't I? Crazy. Crazy. Maybe I should leave it at 120. There we go. It's easier for this. So. As you can see in this picture here, right, there is not much behind the valve seat, especially here on this corner, there's nothing. The material disappears at behind it. And that can affect how stable the valve seat is in its position, right? So all of these things matter, right? All like you see this this cylinder head here. You see there's actually quite a lot of meat behind that ish, but on this side there's a hell of a lot more. And what happens over time, or what can happen over time, is that the valve seat, because it's literally a hammer, it's just like a slide hammer, you just pull, pull with the valve, pull, 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 depending on the alloy you use, depending on how the force, what forces of the springs can apply, depends number of cycles, depends on the 
uh, quality of the aluminium, the actual casting, how porous it is, these can cause valve seats to recess. Now, why is that a problem? Because the valve seat is where the valve stops. If that seat goes further in, then the valve will be pulled further in. The length of the valve is defined so it can start rubbing against your, your actual camshaft, right? Which means that what happens is, is the camshaft causes the valve to stay open. So if you, you know, if the valve seat goes in and the, the, the tip of the valve is hitting the camshaft now, there's no clearance, there's going to be a gap and your engine will start to not run properly and fail. Not fail catastrophically, it'll just won't run properly and won't be able to maintain combustion because your valves are leaking. That's what valve seat recession is. It's like a receding hairline. It is receding into the head. <laughs> Just our work. <laughs> Micro welding and the destruction and pitting of valve seats is not what valve is not what valve recession is. Face uh, seat against recession, sorry. the valve seat under very high temperatures would lead to micro welds between the face and the seat. As the valve opened again, these micro welds would tear, eventually leading to valve seat recession, which is just another word for valve seat failure. So what what is he showing there? I don't know what he's, he's showing there. What 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 is he showing there? It looks like someone's machined out a valve to put a new seat in. Actually, looks like the seat's been removed. Oh, so it actually, looks like someone's machined it out. I don't understand. Why is this a normal seat? <laughs> this is a recessor. That pitting there has got nothing to do with valve seat. It's just it's just nonsense. The engine would lose compression. It's just, you just met that up. We needed a rebuild. Then, then we realized lead is bad for us, so we phased out leaded fuel. And engineers and manufacturers were forced to develop better materials. No, no, and no, no, different, not better. So a lot of valves and valve seats. Oh, chrome, chrome, molybdenum, and, and mangan. Chrome, <laughs> chrome, manganese steels are generally what are used for valve seats or valves. It depends. There's loads of different mixtures that you can use, loads of different combinations, stuff like that. Sexy ones are made out of um, an alloy called 41. Well, actually, let's kind of look. So. That's bollocks. Sorry, but that is bollocks. So, uh, let's just do it. Chrome, mang, mang, it's manga steel. Uh, mag, uh, not, it's not mang, it's manganese, isn't it? Manganese steel. So, chrome manganese steel, um, this stuff, uh, put valves. Valves. So, a lot of the time, weirdly enough, exhaust valves. Uh, it's a common steel that's used um, for just, what is it? Exhaust valves are made of... They're not made of common steels, but high-tech uh, austenitic steel alloys contain chromium, manganese, and nickel, etc., etc. Oops, what have I done here? God, I can't drive. Um, stainless and alloy steels for valve construction. Um, austenitic stainless steel alloys. But yeah, oh, there's even a pattern there. What's that for? Oh, there's a pattern here for advertising steels. Oh. Oh, 1940. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It is uh, expired the lifetime of that. So if you want to use really sexy stuff, 214N is the, the, the bad boy, the super alloy. Oops. Um, super alloys have forms, blah, 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 nickel based and cobalt based super alloys. Work hard and they say, got anything about valves? It probably does just have a valve thing. Um, 214N is like the bad boy. Um, super alloys. Engine valve steel specifications. Uh, 214N is like the, 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 the daddy. Here we go. There's an entire catalogue on it, look. Um, it talks about... There you go, look. So all of these... Um, grades and compositions and so on and so forth. Uh, but I should put valve. Val, it says valve steel there. We've been through that. 
but um, Summit Racing, there you go. Summit Racing, probably, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll use it. Um, sexy, sexy stuff. But there are so many different alloys that they can use. Uh, let's crack on. And designs and manufacturing processes to actually get valves and seats. The, the chrome manganese uh, steels are used on normal production stuff, basically, especially for exhaust valves. To last a reasonable amount without lead. That was the first challenge we had to overcome. No, the, the first challenge was to have steels that could withstand exhaust. One of the first challenges with four-stroke poppet valve engines, just four-stroke engines at the time generally, one of the first problems was valve failures. It was a massive, massive thing was valve failures. Valves used to fail all of the time, right in the the early days, like the 1900s, well, the 18, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s. Exhaust valves were the, 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 the crux. They, if you solve that issue, great. And the reason why is because, yeah, there's the power stroke, but when the intake valve opens, you've got cool air and fuel going past it, taking some of that heat away with it. On the exhaust stroke, you've got your exhaust valve opening. It's enveloped by hot exhaust gases, so it never really gets a good, a good cooling down. So they fail, and Next. they used to pop the heads off. They used to mushroom the ends of the. Because the other thing as well is the valve has to take the camshaft, giving it a good squish. And when these engines started to rattle themselves to pieces during excessive testing and stuff, they used to mushroom and hammer the ends of the tips. All sorts of shit used to happen challenge was the valve spring it too is a big problem because at high rpm when you try to open and close the valves many 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 times in a single second the valve spring cannot keep up it can simply See that valve springs keeping up not open and close that fast that rapidly so instead of full opening and full closure you get something known as valve float the valve just floats around the seat which of course leads to a loss of performance or what it floats around it doesn't know what valve float is right it can simply not open and close that fast that rapidly so instead of full opening and full closure you get something known as valve float the valve just floats around the seat which of course leads to a loss of performance no he thinks the rotation is valve float no 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 so valve float is this Imagine that I've got a, this is my valve face. I've got to open to there, this side of the screen, and then close again. All right? That's what I've got to do. Now, this is caused by the camshaft. It's a physical, it's pushed. All right? So that's all about the camshaft. It's a physical forcing that way. All right? Now, the spring has got to, at the other end, push apart, and that pulls the valve back. But the spring is not a metal on metal contact acceleration right it is about the springiness of the material right and what happens is is that if you keep on going up higher and higher rpm what happens is is that the valve opens and then the valve has opened so quickly that the spring has got to close it in a set amount of time degrees of the crank and what happens is is that the spring has a speed Right. There's the maximum, for that for that lift, there's a maximum speed that the valve can close at because of the spring, right? The spring force, the spring acceleration, right? And what happens is, is that, let's just say from there to there, that's 10 degrees of crank rotation. Now, as the engine goes faster and faster and faster and faster, that 10 degrees happens in a shorter amount of time. So instead of having just, say, a second to get from there to there, right, the engine requires you to in half a second, but the valve can only close, uh, do that distance in a second. These numbers are all nonsense. What I'm saying is, is that the valve needs to go faster and faster and faster, but the spring can physically not close it that quick. A good way to think about it is like this. Imagine you've got a gate, right, where you open the gate and then the gate closes with a spring, right? So it's a torsional spring. You open it and it takes a second to close. Now imagine you can open it quicker than a second. You need it to close it quicker than a second before a lorry hits it or something, you know, whatever. The, but the fact of the matter is, is you can push it open really fast, but the spring will close it in a second, right? So you push it open faster and it closes in a second. 
but the engine is run, needs it to run faster than that before the piston comes up and clamps it. Now, a lot of the times, we're not so much bothered about the, the valve hitting the spring. It's just that the it has to close because this is the timing of the events. And if you having a spring that opens later, a slower, you know, it closes too late, is changing those parameters. You know, so it's almost having like um longer lift duration but you're not you don't want it to happen you want it to happen quicker not slower so valve lift is a uh, valve float is when the valve has been opened and it's meant to be closed and it's not yet like over here it's meant to be closed and it hasn't closed yet that is valve float because the valve is just it's not following the track of what we want now this is where desmos come in because what desmos do is they up forcibly open the valve and forcibly close the valve Right, so they're basically it's like a camshaft for both ends if you want to look at it that way. So they're forcibly closing it. That's how they do stuff like that. Valve bounce is when the valve hits the seat and bounces because the, the spring is either at resonance, so it's not working properly, or the strength of the spring and the inertia of that valve hitting that isn't enough. So the inertia of the valve is too high for that spring set. Even worse, in an interference engine, it leads to contact between the valve. It can, but this is the thing. If the valve closes two milliseconds later than it should, that means that our timing of everything, resonance, all the rest of it, is off. And as your cylinder can leak slightly. It doesn't necessarily... Eventually, if you have too much float, but generally valves don't float that much. They'll float a bit if you've got an, a, a not well-designed engine. And this is always at highest RPM, right? This is when it always turns to mush. And this is why a lot of engines have dual springs. They have a, a spring on the outside and a spring on the inside. That's resonance. Um, it's to do with resonance. It's also to do with inertia and accelerations and stuff like that as well. So there's all sorts of things going on. The resonance problem is when a spring reaches its uh, resonance frequency and basically the elastic properties of the spring become unreliable. So in other words, it's springiness. It stops being springy in certain RPM modes, certain vibrational modes. Valve and the piston, which leads to a bent valve. Again, a loss of compression. You need an engine. Rebuild. Well, you've, you've bugged your engine. You don't need to worry about loss of compression. The engine's fucked. <laughs> uh, Ducati developed a very complex and maintenance-heavy dysmodromic system. Ducati developed a very complex and maintenance-heavy dysmodromic system. Maintenance-heavy. I don't know why that, that's... You're talking about fundamentals here. I don't know why that really matters in this context. ...dramic system just to get rid of the valve spring. Well... <laughs> It's funny. It, it, yes, it does. Maintenance as in a valve spring, but in this entire demonstration, you can see springs. Heavy dysmodromic system just to get. You can literally see springs, right? So they haven't completely got rid of springs. Um, they've got rid of valve springs, and the inherent problem with valve float. But we've designed a way around that, so it's kind of nonsense. Rid of the valve spring. Yeah, you know, it, it still uses a spring. And it uses a spring to get rid of the backlash uh, for clearance issues because of temperatures, expand, thermal expansion. Koenigsegg developed the extremely complex free valve system just to get rid of the capture. Which has springs in it. Okay, cool. But neither of these... It wasn't just... You see, this is the thing. It, just to get rid of the camshaft. No, 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 no. If the free valve system worked, which it still hasn't, still not here... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, so they've got a hundred, infinite control. That's why they did it. That's why they wanted to do it. Technologies ever you know, became... with that really shit idea of a poppet valve. In mainstream. In the mainstream, engineers persisted with the conventional valve and the conventional... For a good reason. ...conventional spring, the conventional valve train. They people seem to just... He, or he specifically seems to think, oh, it's conventional. It's conventional because people are lazy. Or retarded. There are better ways. It sounds like tin foil hat. Persisted. They pushed harder and they developed things better. We got better valve spring materials, better designs, and eventually we got engines that still They've missed some of the major points, like multiple valves, um, different valve profiles, different valve shapes. There's loads of things that were done to to you know uh, the 
ramps and the general cam profile. Who had conventional valve springs, but they revved to the moon. They persisted even further, and we got variable valve timing and lift control That's system. That's got nothing to do with the valve. I don't see what this has got to do one versus the other. It can well, it's actually weird that you bring up variable valve timing and variable valve lift. That's a bit weird, is that? But we'll, we'll get to that later. Much anything that Koenigsegg's free valve can do. Oh, look, look. there's loads of springs there. The valve remained, and the conventional valve train remained, and with a lot of effort, we made it better and better. But there's something that no amount of technological development can resolve with the valve because it's an inherent problem in its shape. And that's that the valve, which is supposed to let air in and out of the engine, is actually an obstacle to airflow. It impedes and slows down the flow of gases in and out of the engine. But you do realize, right, that, you see, this is it's a tiny bit nonsense because... The air has to slow down when it hits the cylinder. It will stop and revert direction, which is stopping. So the fact of the matter is, is that it goes in the port, it, it gets diverted into a bigger into a bigger volume. There's also the diffusion properties of having small intakes and a big cylinder. So the the losses aren't well, his example isn't exactly the whole story. Imagine you have a container A and a container B. Now imagine that you want to get the maximum amount of gases at the maximum speed from container A to container B. What kind of shape would you use? It's well, silly. What do you mean what kind of shape? Have I got infinite possibilities? Well, I'd make a passage that's the same cross-sectional area as this, the same size as it. Both physics and common sense. The, the physics and common. It makes it sound like they're, 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 they're interchangeable. Physics and common sense. Physics is the real world. Common sense is in your head and it has no academic standing. It means nothing. <laughs> tell us that the best they don't shape. tell us anything. Physics tells us things. Common sense. Ah, just, just really pisses me off that does is a simple, straight, open-ended tube. But unfortunately... Oh, we're just restricted to that. Okay, cool. With valves, we can kiss a straight tube goodbye. The shape of the valve no, means... The tube is the same. You see, let's just take your example. The poppet valve is here, in the cylinder, in the combustion chamber. It lives in here. It's already in here. Now, yes, deflecting some of the air causes a resistance, right? But it's going to cause a resistance downstream anyway. Just after, like some of the strokes of these engines are like an inch. You know what I mean? It's like you, you, you're delaying the inevitable. Now, don't get me wrong. Right, it's, there is a point to be made here that having the valve in the way does slow down the air and cause a restriction in this, in this, you know, in your port. Just say, but. Like I said right at the beginning, at what expense, right? Because you've got to seal it somehow. There's going to have to be a trap door somewhere. So let's just say we have a little flap. As we close this flap or as we open this flap, it's a restriction. Throttle bodies with their butterflies are restrictions. But weirdly enough, they're meant to be restrictions. That's what they do that instead of a straight tube, we have something like this. They ask is that this optimal shape? Well, it's not an optimal shape, is it? It's just if you have a constant cross-section, then it's the least impeding to airflow, right? Where putting a valve in it will impede it to a certain degree. But the fact of the matter is, you do realise you, you do want to close this off. The idea is to stop airflow. That's what you've got to do, or stop what's in the cylinder getting out. So you've got a balancing act here. So it's like, this is just inherently stupid. It's like, well, I hope your rotary valve doesn't do any of this. It must fall around the valve. It cannot go straight out through the tube. The aerodynamic shape of the valve does help to smooth it. The air also doesn't bend a corner. It goes like this and then hits the cylinder wall, which if it spilled in, it would still end up hitting the piston, splashing out, hitting the walls and bouncing back. So you're just delaying the inevitable. And this at the top 
this optimum ship doesn't have a valve in it. We need a valve. <laughs> we need to shut the door. You can't compare this to this. Now, the what you've got to do is you've got to compare poppet valves to other valve arrangements, like a trapdoor, like an iris, like a throttle body. You've got to compare it to all these and then say, do you know what? The throttle body doesn't seal. Do you know what? The trapdoor has also inherent problems and also doesn't seal properly. You see what I mean? It's like, hmm. But still, the gas must go around the valve. It must circumvent it to get in and out of the chamber. In there is no... Out of the chamber, I don't understand what that means. No denying the fact that gases would have a much easier time if the poppet valve simply wasn't there. But then the engine doesn't work. It's a sim... <laughs> it's a fact that it'd be easier if it was just a tube. It's also a fact that nothing would seal. <laughs> this is a pointless exercise in being a smug git. But we got around this too. We created clever intake manifolds with variable lengths and clever resonances to... Re What's that got to do with anything? That, that doesn't get around a valve. What are you talking about? Inertial filling has got nothing to do with it. That's just got to do with closing of any valve... In other words, all the things that he's mentioning here, basically resonance and inertial filling and all the rest of it, this is all this would be any valve. This would this <laughs> Bam the air past the valve. We created forced induction. That valve. This valve here, it's crazy. It causes a restriction when it's open. Restricting all the flow here, look form of super and turbochargers to stuff more air into the chamber. That's, that, we... that would happen regardless of what valve you use. You see, the points you are making have to be specific to poppet valves is the case that you're making, but they're not. These would happen regardless. Created long and complicated exhaust manifolds to help suck the exhaust gas out of the chamber. Doesn't suck, but regardless. Again, that's got nothing to do with poppet valves specifically. When you think about it, a lot of the development of the internal combustion engine has actually been an effort to work around the valve. Nope. Nope. Prove it. You haven't proved it because all of those things that you've said as examples aren't to work around the valve. They're to work in tandem with the valve. And tell me what other valves won't do with that. All of these systems you've mentioned, be it, uh, you know, port sleet. Uh, Ports in the side of a, a side of a, a, a chamber, like with wankles, right? They can still use turbos. They still use variable runner lengths. <laughs> None of those things are inherent to poppet valves, you muppet. So what are you talking about? When you observe a typical engine, you will see that a cylinder head together with the intake. Oh, I do love this bit. Well, number one is your your engine your pitch is terrible because the rest of that is the cylinder block and that's the gearbox exhaust manifolds takes up more space than the heart of the engine. Right, so as far as I understand this specific engine, we've got intercoolers, nothing to do with poppet valves, air intakes, uh, you know, um, like a plenum chamber or what have you, although saying that there is a manifold up here as well. I don't know what all this gubbins is exactly for this specific engine. All this is nothing to do with poppet valves. Looks like there's a turbo stuffed in there, maybe one on the other side. Again, nothing to do with poppet valves. This entire cylinder head here section, the rotary valve has this. Like you put two rotary valves in here, one for the intake, one for the exhaust, same thing. I don't understand what the difference is. And it's driven by a chain sprocket and time in basically the valve train. What is the difference? A lot of this up here is also the fueling and the coolant systems. So maybe this actually, maybe this is the cool. No, that's the air. That's the air. So this looks like an intercooler. Not entirely sure what this is. Shows air going in. Probably something to do with the turbo. This is probably where the filters go. I imagine it's probably just where the filter boxes go and the intakes for the turbos. Um, <laughs> breathing equipment. But this has got nothing to do with poppet valves. This is just air management. Which is the engine block where Not that is a lot of this is the turbo. Turbo and intercooler. Get rid of all that shit. Then you don't need all this rubbish. You can just have a manifold with an air filter on top of it. Sorted. 
crankshaft, rods, and pistons are. We need more space for the breathing equipment because valves make breathing hard. No, no, no. <laughs> well, replace it with another valve. Let's see how much different it is. Get that picture before, right? Now, let's just imagine this has got a rotary valve in it. What have we replaced? Well, we still want the turbo, right? Because this is a turbo engine. We want to cram... That's the displacement problem. That's nothing else. That's piston, the vault, the cylinders. Right, so we need uh, an intake system for the in for the uh, turbos. Cool, that stays. We need an intercooler because the waste heat, you know, you're, putting, you're doing work to the air to pump it and compress it, so you need an intercooler. Cool. Then you need ducting for that to happen. Cool. Then you need a plenum and a fucking all of the... Um, fuel injection systems, the throttle bodies, maybe an exhaust gas re recirculation system, all that jazz. Still need all of this. The gearbox has to stay and the cylinder heads have to stay because the rotary valves and ports have to live somewhere and spark plugs and injectors have to go somewhere. So, what changes? Pop it valves problem, of course. <laughs> More space for it's the breathing. Like you're an idiot. I I'm sorry, right? I do try to be just technical. But it just gets annoying. It's it would. just to make videos. It's just to make videos. It's it's Dell all over. Because valves make breathing hard. But what if what if there was a better way? What if we simply got rid of the valve instead of so valves or pop it? It must mean pop it valve because he's chucked the pop it valve and he's going to replace it with the valve. So when he says valve, it means pop it valve. Trying to constantly work around. Of course, many engineers asked this very question over the years, and they did indeed come up with a bunch of alternatives. Oh, did they? When? One of the more promising and more elegant ones is called a rotary valve. It's more elegant, why? Instead of a puppet valve, valve seat, spring, retainer, rocker arm, lifter, and camshaft... Right, so you're missing quite a few here, because you've got... Okay, valve. This is the valve. The valve seat and the valve... The two halves are the same coin. It's like having a, a, a ball valve. You've got the ball and then the housing, right? You, they kind of they go hand in hand. Okay, so you're missing your your valve spring, uh, your valve your valve seat, right? You're missing that one, but who, who cares? And you're missing the collets as well. You got your valve retainer, the collets. Then you've got a rock around with a roller in it. Then you've got to tap it, and then you've got a camshaft. Are we living in 1912? I don't understand why we're living in 1912, um, because. Modern engines have all of this with a, a valve spring seat and a, a, a bucket. Even if you run them shimless, right, you can just use solid buckets. If you're using the race engine kind of thing, then you don't need to worry about adjustability. You just get a new bucket because you're going to junk them anyway, right? So you could just have camshaft on bucket. So this one you can get rid of, that one you can get rid of. You can add a bucket and have a little washer. A little, basically, it's just a washer. A valve guard. He's missing a valve guard as well. Well, with this... Look at the difference, apart from there's the main body, which is like a camshaft, then there's the seals, seals, and you've got to remember as well, this has no inherent problems. That's the other point, right? It has no inherent problems. This system reliably has sealed for quadrillions of miles of loads of different vehicles. This thing, not so much, right? So it's all right comparing like for like when they're not like for like. All we have is a rotating barrel with cavities. As the barrel rotates, the cavities line up with other cavities in the cylinder head to let air in and out of the engine. So what we actually have now is a straight, open-ended, obstructionist... Right, so what you want to do about look at this, this here... ...actually have now is a straight... So if we look at this little animation they've got here... Right, it, it's 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 bad. Right, so the piston's already on its way down. Right, and this is half opening. You see, this is a restriction. See, you see these dark bits here. These are restrictions. These dark bits are restrictions. That's what they are. Right, you want it all. If you look how it how all the velocity goes up in red. Right. Look how it then increases. You see, this is a restriction here. This dark blue, all these dark blue bits are restrictions. Not not restrictions. It's where the flow has slowed down. In this case, it's generally because it's a restriction. Right? 
so you're looking at flow velocities. Now, now it's good when it straightens up. Now it's good. Now it acts like the tube that he wanted. Look at that. Right, what you want is a nice even colour. And you're always going to have, because of friction, because of boundary layer effects, because you can have this friction between the side, you're always going to have slower. So this is what you want, but that's not what we saw as the, it opens and closes. Open-ended. Like there, look. What's all this? This is going mental. Oops. Like this. Great. Instruction OS2. Cool. It's great. Which means perfect, that has no problem. Dramatically improved airflow compared to a puppet valve. You see, you see how we've got a good mixture here. And when you're talking about mixing fuel and air, you see how you're pouring this in and this is all stagnant. Hmm, does that mean we get an efficient burn or not? Well, not enough studies have been done. And if you look at this arrangement, look at this port, right? They've gone and used the shittest port they can get. What port looks like that, right? A Briggs and Stratton engine, pretty much. That's what looks like that. Looks like crap. The other problem is, as well, is what about cross sectional area? Because this is really quite small versus this. This is, you know, this is a ring. This is quite a big ring, is this? If you take the cross sectional area across there, it's like, ooh. So what's going on? We don't know. We don't know. Which means better performance and the OS. And then you just blanket term better performance. Now, I have read the paper on this. And they don't bring up a lot of these issues, and they are comparing it. They're basically using handheld trimmer motors, which are notoriously high performance engines. <laughs> a 50, I think it's a 50 cc, was it a 50 cc? A 48 cc engine, I believe. I did Need. read the paper, like I say, there's a lot of bits they miss. For complicated They are literally talking about trimmers. It can exhaust manifolds. We also don't have valve springs, which means we're not wasting energy and compressing them. Also, look at what happens to the exhaust here. We also don't have valve springs, which means we're not... Watch what happens. Wasting... Alright, so we get some weird flow characteristics going on. Energy and... Then we get... This isn't flow reversal, don't think that's what that is. But what's happening is it's weird. Compressing them, which means again more power, more efficiency. Weird, weird thing going on. So because there's no valve so springs, stop start, stop start, stop start. That's not flow reversal. Don't, don't think. It basically just means that it was going faster here. Now it's going faster here. That's not flow reversal. That's just all this weird shit going on. There's no possibility for valve fault at any RPM, which means that achieving ridiculous RPM is much easier. No, no, no. You see, RPM is limited by how well you get volumetric efficiency. So basically, how quick you can get the air to move, which, you know, the size of your ports, um, restrictions in the way, of course, throttle opening, um, what condition the air was before it went in, resonances, all these things play a part. So accelerating the air and piston, piston, bought a stroke. So have you got a long stroke or have you got a really short stroke that makes a really large area? It, there's, there's a lot involved. As usual, it's not just straight line, this is better than this. Also, this system, the rotary valve barrel system, is is much more simple than a conventional valve train. It has a great reduced number of parts, which means uh, less complexity, less chance of failure, and oh, also... Oh, oh, I love that. I love that. So this is one I hate. Listen to what he says. Don't read them. Listen to what it says. ...to reduce number of parts, which means uh, less complexity, less chance of failure, and also reduced engine size and weight. Right. So, less parts equals less chance of failure. Okay, let's take the first jet engine, Frank Whittle's jet engine. It was terribly unreliable. Let's take the first jet engines, terribly unreliable. A Trent engine today is so much more complicated, has so many more parts, but a Trent engine is a lot more reliable. More parts equals crap reliability, more chances to fail. It doesn't, it doesn't. They are not systematic, they are not, they're not related, they're not, one isn't related to the other. So it says better airflow, more power and efficiency, right? So you've got to be so careful. 
better airflow, there is a possibility, and some of the data shows that there is better airflow and some different characteristics. But more efficiency, it depends what you mean. If you mean fuel efficient, maybe not, because the fuel mixing isn't as good. That's evident. You can just see from the, the simulations around. Um, because you have stagnant regions in the combustion chamber. Uh, more power is yet to be seen, really, on proper engine. When you compare apples to apples, not apples to a shitty Briggs & Stratton motor. Um, no efficiency losses from springs. He doesn't understand springs. Um, it, this is the thing. The valve train losses are friction-based. And, and here's another thing. How much are the friction losses, right? Well, a 50cc engine, a moped 50cc engine, can not only run at idle under its own springs and all the other frictional losses and pumping losses and waste heat and all that jazz, but can also accelerate a man weighing 100 kilograms to about 35, 40 mile an hour with air resistance included. That's pretty good. So what are the spring losses in this two-spring 50cc moped engine not much not much at all you know what i mean it's got to overcome the springs in the cvt clutch seems to do it fine you get what i mean so as a percentage it's bugger all it's bugger all of nothing no valve float ever true right true but then saying that you can design around that less moving parts uh, if you talk about inertia you see just just blanketly saying that Less moving parts, but the inertia, yes. Less friction, mm -hmm. who knows. Reduced engine size and weight. Depends, depends. Do you know what? This is the thing, right? Formula One looked into this. There's a thing called a Bishop Valve, right? Uh, F1 Bishop Valve. The, again, like everything, these valves and stuff have been around for a long, long time. Right. Oh, look, I did a video about it, rotating valves, the Bishop valve. <laughs> I did a video about it. It's crazy. When was that video? Probably a long time ago. 2018. So, a long time ago. Crazy, eh? Look at this, where I talk about... Is that if you have... Uh, when you do compression... Jesus Christ. That's weird, isn't it? But... <laughs> Basically, Formula One had a, had a caddy, and I think it was, is it Ilmore? They did it. But these have been around forever, right? Here's another tech talk. Uh, these have been around for donkey's years, right? absolutely donkey's years. Um, but they did a, a, an analysis on these things, and they're a bitch to seal. And there's loads of different types of seals, loads of different types of valves. Uh, Bishop, who was the other one? Frank... Oh, what's his face? Frank someone did a lot of research into rotary valves. Uh, everyone's had a, had a crack at it. The problem is is that it's incredibly hard to do. And, you know, they're chucking up Formula 1 money at it and they couldn't get it to work properly or reliably. And, yeah, so... And, you know, they, 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 they did all of this um, simulation stuff they did all of this stuff. There's an entire paper on it. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of... I think it was Mercedes that did most of the work. So the rotary valve... Um, but it, it, sorry, let me go back a minute just to make the point. It says reduced engine size and weight. Uh, it's quite big. All right, so F1 Bishop valve. All right, it, it is quite big. If you look at it compared to a cylinder head, uh, just like the picture I use for, oh, picture I use for a thumbnail... Or these ones, um, you know, here it is. There's one here with the valve train. You're going to rotate it that way. There's loads of different ways you could do it um, with injectors and trumpets and all this jazz. Uh, they opted for this kind of design because they thought this was the most beneficial. But if you look at the size of the piston and the size of this, um, the, the ring gear on the end of this is the size of the piston. Let's just say that's 100 millimeters. You know, it, it it's getting there, and there's shit on top of it as well. So it's quite big, and there's been patents that have been bloody filed on it, and etc. 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 It was, uh, let's say it wasn't tiny. Let's just put it that way. Um, and the, there are loads of different types. 
rotating ports like a two stroke. It's, it goes on and on. And even look, there's even what looks like a, a mincer. <laughs> Put your beef in there and you can mince away. There's also the RCV. So there's the rotating cylinder valve, the RCV engine, which is a different type, um, which basically just has a rotating sleeve. This thing here, this thing here has a rotating sleeve with ports that line up. They've tried all sorts. Pretty much everything has been tried. And, or nearly all, pretty much. Is better than a conventional valve train in every way. Oh, I hope you're actually going to stick to that. Okay, so where oh, so, is it? So he's going, he's going with that then. It is better in every way. Every way. It doesn't seal, but it's better than every way. Size and weight. So the rotary valve is better than a conventional valve train in every way. How do you have... You don't need... So you've got this weird problem where you open the ports, but the ports kind of open like this, where it opens, and then it opens, and then on the other side it closes, you know, it closes, it closes like that. It's like, hmm, like a port in a two-stroke or a wankel engine, which have, have other issues. So there's that. If you cheat, how do you have, like, variable lift, how, how do you have variable duration? You can't really slow it down. That'd be weird, especially at these high RPMs. You can change when it opens. Just say, look, not even like a power valve, because a power valve can change the duration of the port, not just when it opens, um, due to the the piston. Um, so you can do some of it, but not all of it. Okay. So where is it then? If it's better in every way, why have you've you... You've made that decision. That decision isn't true. <laughs> why have we been using the poppet valve for the past 100 years and not the rotary valve barrel? Well, that's because the rotary valve is better than the poppet in everything except one thing. Oh, so you're going back on what you said. Right, okay, cool. It's better than every way. Every way. And that one thing is sealing. It is difficult to achieve a good seal with a rotary valve arrangement like this one, but it's not impossible. It is difficult because to seal the right, rotary... So you got to be careful here because seal means something. If something is watertight, things are watertight and things are not watertight. They're, they're, there's a dichotomy there. To seal means it's sealed. If... It's difficult, it's still seal you still sealed it. The fact of the matter is these aren't sealed. That's the problem. Rotary valve barrel must eat the problem is as well, it's like just with exhaust valves that they've spent a long time signing out. This end, just say if this is the exhaust, this gets very hot. This gets very hot this end, and this end is cooler, and this causes differentiated expansion. So this end expands, which means you've got to have higher clearances on one end. This is what Formula One found. <laughs> rotate inside a round seal or rotate together with some sort of O-ring and then the O-ring will seal against some sort of casing. Well, you, you, you do realize that O-rings don't stop combustion, right? You do realize that's, that's not a really a thing. Plenty of O-rings and round seals in every engine, for example, the, the crankshaft and the camshaft ends. Also not serving combustion, but go on. They rotate in round seals, but there's an issue. None of the parts that have I'll give him that. round or rubber O-rings and round seals on the it's the it, It's a couple of things. Combustion gases can be quite corrosive. They are hot. Uh, some of the chemistry is quite nasty. Uh, they have to seal, they have to be airtight, obviously. They have to seal against something that's moving. They have to deal with expansion and contraction due to operating temperatures. It is also then the pressure. That's a big thing. And none of them are exposed directly to combustion heat, but a rotary valve barrel a bit is... Pressure is the first thing, because when you get your first combustion event, Everything's still cold, but you've got to be able to take the pressure. Because it's exposed directly to combustion heat, it expands a lot more. Now, no, the prop material problems, 
like o-rings melting or being corroded away it's not just that yeah the problem with expansion is that a I think he's watched my video but got the wrong point because what I was talking about was specifically that arrangement that the Formula One paper shows. Round seal, when rolling a rubber round seal needs very tight tolerances to operate. Oh, what do you mean tolerances? Do you mean clearances? What are you talking about? A lot more. Now, the problem with expansion is that a round seal, when rolling a rubber round seal, needs very tight tolerances. It means clearances. Is another fool who doesn't know the difference. To operate. When the part expands, maintaining these tolerances becomes very hard, and then the seals... No, the seal isn't the problem. The seals use it to form, like piston rings, like O-rings, like all kinds of seals. Uh, well, no, not O-rings, like oil seals and piston rings right they adapt their dynamic seals they change to the conditions um that's not what you're talking about right and o-rings don't shouldn't shouldn't and o-rings don't rotate you don't want to use o-rings to rotate they will nip up cripple and just break right if you think about o-rings they use the injectors they used to hold calipers together. They used to hold cylinder heads together for certain applications. Oil ring passages, all sorts of things like that, right? But these are just an interface where you mash two things together and an O-ring acts like a, a... It's basically a gasket, right? It's a deformable gasket. And that's what they're used for. When you come to rotating things, you use lip seals, right? Or labyrinth seals or piston rings. And a piston ring does rotate, but actually that's a linear seal. But still... You use things like that, right? Um, if you think, you say, well, what about the seal in a piston for your brakes? It doesn't really move much, does it? And it's more of a wiper seal due to its shape. But this isn't the problem. The problem is, is you've got this drum that has to be close to the, the, the hole, the bore that it's in, to seal but then it will expand, and that's the problem. Is it's got, It has to have the clearance, but then not rattle around, move, and it's not obviously sealing. Either fail or wear much faster than we want to. But as I said, it's not impossible to do it, and in fact, it has been done. It, right, so it has sealed. We've got sealed ones. Okay, cool. Where? A man by the name of Ralph Watson has built and operated an engine with a similar... I do find this funny. Nothing against very, Ralph at all, but this is funny. Very similar to the one I'm Here's showing. my example of this actually working. You hear successfully and raced it successfully since 1980. Nine. Okay then, so if that's the case, they're push rods and rockers, they're rocker housings and push rods. What's this picture for? I don't understand. Because this can't be it, surely. Because you're not using push rods, are you? <laughs> Raced it successfully since 1989. Now what Mr. Watson did is that he made a custom rotary valve system for a British BSA 90 degree V-twin engine. So, one thing you'll notice about this BSA, and I'm sure he's not actually entirely sure what a BSA is, is that that's an air-cooled engine. The height of performance. And number two is, and he does mention this later, it's sealed. It doesn't mean sealed from the outside world. It means sealed contained in the system. For example, your coolant and your oil need to be sealed not only from the outside world, but from each other. See, that's what matters. His system employs conventional material O-rings together with wavy rings, additional bronze seals. Oh, it doesn't, shouldn't be using O-rings at all like that. Oh, them bearings. That looks well light. <laughs> you got to remember, this is for a single cylinder. A single cylinder. Look at the size of this thing. Look at these bearings. He ultra light, these things. This is just... A, and does it look smaller to you? I don't think it looks smaller to me. And spring all the levers to ensure that the O-rings perform as they should during engine operation and that the valve remains sealed. The rotary barrel sits on oiled bearings and has overall proven itself as an effective and reliable system. It does a couple of hill climbs. How often does this happen? 
Has it done a million miles? Or has it done a hundred thousand miles at least? No, it hasn't. As I said, this engine has been used and raced extensively for several decades, in fact... Well, extensively? If it's ten times a year? No. Dun, and dun, it's an air-cooled engine. It's not exactly screaming horsepower, is it? See, this matters. <laughs> you want to rely... Poppet valves work in drag racing. They work in MotoGP, Formula One. They work in aviation. They work everywhere. Great things they are. The project is so good that it outlived Ralph Watson himself. The, the car, the BSA Special, now has a new owner. So although this is not some sort of uh, mass-produced, daily-driven app... <laughs> National Socialism outlived Hitler. Good idea. <laughs> ...application, it is still very valuable because it's a obvious proof of concept that rotary valve technology can work and can be employed in practice. But, but that doesn't mean it's better than the system we have. Oh, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Colin Furs makes all sorts of inventions, like the Cake-O-Matic, where he has an engine spoon-feed cake into his mouth. Some of it went in his mouth, therefore it's a proof of concept that it's possible. Oh. What we also have now uh, is an ambition to take rotary valve technology into the mainstream, into mass production, and this ambition comes in the form uh, of a company called Vaztec. Oh, from, here we uh, you just know it. You just bloody know it. He's found an engine. They've put an advert on Facebook and it's given the idea to do the video. Uh, North Carolina in the United States. In fact, the animation I've been Our showing you... Our technology. White papers. So the SA Japan development of a rotary valve engine, that's not theirs. I don't think... Oh, no, actually, no, they're, sorry, they were on the paper. I think they were on the paper with strimmers. The, these pictures they're using are really... That's in the Hillier's book, is this, I think? The, the, these have been around for donkey's years. Like, the Bishop valve, it, the pants, you can't really get any pants on these things unless it's a very specific rocker arm or something. You know, like you, you, little bits that you can easily design around. The idea is all hold. So this is an oil-free rotating valve train technology. Oil-free. Ah, cool. Is from Vastic's website. Does it give you free oil? Is that what you mean? Because you can't mean that it, it's not lubricated in any way. Surely not. The company's composed. Increase volumetric, improve volumetric efficiency. <clears throat> Prove it. Uh, improve filling and trapping. I don't know what that means. I, I understand what the words mean. I, I don't understand what they're getting at. So surely volumetric efficiency would just be enough. Increased combustion turbulence. Improved exhaust flow, which would all be to do with mm, volumetric efficiency. The largely of XG. Rotary valve is an alternative design to the traditional poppet valve and is used for controlling the intake and exhaust. Blah, blah, blah. As depicted in the photos above, which uh, photos uh, or below, sorry. A simple shaft with a slot cut across its ax axis provides a flow path for the intake charge and exhaust gases. M engine. De oh, this is their crap one. Yeah, it looks like it's probably not optimised. How heavy is that? Ah, okay. Um, it turns, rotated. <laughs> turns, in brackets, rotated, because you might not know what that means. The slots are exposed to ports in the cylinder head that allow the charger to... What is it, what is it, what is it? Right, so when you're you've got these ports into your cylinder head, are you, in, you you've got to include them into your um, combustion volume, right? You, you know your your compression volume, like your swept and your total volume, and you've got to and your clearance volume, you've got to include all that, right? How does that affect how the engine is designed as a whole? Developers, how do you keep it cool? Who want to take this? Rotary valve can provide very efficient cylinder filling and mixing large. Mixing, oh, filling due to the resulting tumble effect demonstrated in our CFD analysis. This behavior results in improved speed of combustion as measured in our working prototype. Speed of combustion? Why do people think that the speed of combustion really matters? It's strange. This technology into mass production. As you can see the graphic below, the rotary valve is a capability of having very high discharge efficiencies, the ratio of actual airflow to perfect flow. Okay, so the, the, the talk about the, the valve overlap is he has the, the, the valve and the whole, the port line up. So you can see what, what's going on here, right? Uh, this is much higher as possible in the event of most advanced 
This is much higher than is possible with even the most advanced poppet valves. But it doesn't seal. <laughs> See, the thing is, sealing really matters and the poppet valve beats you. It's like saying, I can I can fall a lot faster than Usain Bolt out of a plane. Yes, but Usain Bolt survives. I don't. I die. So what's the point? Action. Uh... And their design noise testing is a rotary sound pressure measured by the near field microphone was three times higher for the poppet valve system. Well, that might be all due to all sorts of things, like the fact that you can literally hear it hammering away because of what's actually in the way. Um, and it depends what, you, what you're comparing this against. Like for like people, like for like. Valve barrel with cavities similar to and Ralph. really when you ranges go from combustion, do you really care? Watsons, there are differences in sealing, but the big difference is that improved flow, high in cylinder turbulence, increased combustion speed, lean burn capabilities. You want to prove that one out? Simple rotational motion, elimination of reciprocating parts. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that one. No cam to tap it noise. Uh, I'll give you that one. But then saying that how, how much of your noise is coming from combustion because you're not sealing properly. Reduced harmonics. I don't know why that matters if you reduce... Oh, no, sorry, it's about noise and vibration. Reduced cost. Simplified valve train, low part count. But it depends how much the parts cost. It always comes down to this. You can have less parts, but if they cost a lot. Uh, Oil-free valve train, cylinder head. That's Why is that not ticked? Elimination of valve adjustment and valve seat recession. Right, yeah, that's true. But elimination of valves, valve adjustment. You never have to adjust this thing, no? You just, it just, you don't have to replace the seals that often. See, that's the thing. How long does that last? Eliminates risk of pistons to valve contact. That is very true. Very true. Uh, Wastic cylinder head no longer has any oil in it. Their design does not need oil in the cylinder head. In fact, all the oil now stays in the engine block. They have patented a rotary valve sealing system that consists of upper and lower valve seals to get red. with gland gaskets, thrust washers, and support bearings. And they have presented... So was it a 44.8cc? Uh, yeah, that was the one. Um, so it's a strimmer engine. Cool. Their concept on a conference of the Japanese Society of Automotive Engineers in 2022, where they won an award for their paper. Here you can see the they award these the hand out these awards like toffees. Comparison of required parts between Why do you read all the rest of it? Because that's actually more important when they look at what's this? This is a thermal model of one versus the other. But you, the problem is I can't see the scale. I couldn't even see the scale of the paper. You can't see the scale of what the temperature model is there. Because I can see right now that the digits aren't the same. So the way that like SolidWorks CFD works is that you can set this scale. So I could set this scale to zero degrees and a hundred and it go red, or zero degrees and eight hundred and it go red where it gets to eight hundred. You get what I mean? We don't know if these scales are the same. Um it's what's it say? The data plotted in figure six suggests that the compression stroke shows little pressure losses than the dynamic sealing capabilities. Little pressure losses but little is not zero, is it? What what deviation is seen from the polytropic compression line is assumed to be largely due to heat losses. Oh, that's great for a heat engine, which are to be expecting a small bore engine with a high surface of volume area in the combustion chamber assembly. Uh, but you, I thought you were meant to be comparing one engine versus the other. Similarly, the higher pressure of the expansion stroke also appears to be well sealed, as inferred from the expansion traces closely followed the polytropic line. This sealing performance addresses one of the main problems with previous rotary valve design attempts, and that being the sealing of high pressure in the cylinder. The shape of the intake exhaust curves also show good flow performance. One in a ward. It's strange that, isn't it? It's strange that um, they, they talk about sealing problems that aren't perfect, where poppet valves fucking spot on. For their paper. Here you can see the comparison of required parts between this the valve. He understands, so he's put this bit up. Plastic system and an equivalent 50 cc power equipment engine. As you can see, the Vastic cylinder head requires less than half the parts.
At this time, they have goals to introduce the technology to small handheld engines and power equipment, but aim to expand to vehicular applications in the future. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just make me a dirt bike version so we can test it? You see, this is the thing. It's a one-cylinder engine, 250cc, go for it. High RPM, high output, high stress on the engine. Let's see it. Let's see it under load. Let's have some guy ride it around the dirt track and don't tell him which bike has got which valve in it. Literally do a blind test. Build a metal box around the cylinder head so you can't tell. Right? Only you know. And you give it to him and you look at his times. You say which one feels better, which is more responsive. And if he turns around and says, this one's normal, this one feels normal, this one bogs down when I do this. or this. Because you've got to test it. You want it. You want to try and make it fail, and if it doesn't fail, then you've got a good little cookie. You, this is great. You've got to try and find the weaknesses. Not blood, suck your own dick. Fucking hell. So, overall, sounds very promising, right? Rotary valves, many benefits. So, are we going to see it? For a hundred and something years, and no one's been able to make something really viable from it because they don't seal properly. And the inherent thermal issues. This is the problem when you do tiny little model engines. You can make pretty much fucking anything work. It in the next decade, maybe two, is it going to happen? Well, maybe. I think it's uh, weird that you didn't mention the F1 stuff. Uh, when they went, it, nah. <laughs> it is promising. The benefits are undeniable, but... Oh, they're undeniable. Uh, the timing is not ideal. We have two obstacles for rotary valves becoming mainstream in the near future. The first obstacle is that many industries... I know that you were born yesterday, right? But what do you think was happening in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and all it's now? Like, he's going to start talking about, about EVs and stuff, but that's a relatively new thing. What happened in the 70s? Well, they worked on this, and they found out, just like they did with the Bork engine and all the other shit, and the Scotch York, doesn't work properly. It doesn't work as well. Industries are now going through a, let's say, a love affair with electrification and whether that love affair actually turns into a marriage only it's time. Only a marriage is too late. Will tell. But the love affair does, to an extent, impede large scale investments into combustion technology. No, 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 no. You show people this shit working and you will get investment off somebody. It will be in production in eh, about five years. The other issue is that many major important combustion technology uh, manufacturers and developers have spent insane amounts of research and development into the conventional puppet valve train. So they want to see a return on their investment. Which F1. Do I need to say any more? Which means that they preferably want to keep selling the conventional valve train for as long as possible. So. The timing is... There is the tooling argument, but the fact of the matter is, is if it was so much better in every single way, surely that helps them, right? Surely that helps them in their endeavour. Because their biggest, the biggest thing that the manufacturers are fighting now is getting the emissions in the bag. That is the biggest problem. And if this has got better turbulence, better efficiency... It's lighter, which means you can use a smaller engine, smaller CCs, etc., etc. If all of these parasitic losses are such a problem, you know, massive, massive problem, then you can regain those efficiencies. Look what the Sky Active did. They had to redesign the whole bloody thing right from the ground up to fit all this crap in, just to squeeze a bit more out of it. Surely this would be easier. Nah, doesn't work. Deal, despite the benefits. Speaking of the benefits, are there any drawbacks other than the ceiling? Well, there are but two... That's, a big pitch. <laughs> that's like saying, we've built the Saturn V. Cool, it works. Engines fire, right? The fuel management system, the guidance computer, it all works. What's the problem? Uh, every single metal on Earth seems to be permeable to the vacuum of space. Oh. So basically, every single material we put in space, it leaks, and everyone inside suffocates and dies. Yes. But apart from that problem, everything's good. Three, two, one, launch. <laughs> this is like, this is almost sounds like a SpaceX excuse, right? Well, we, we got further than we did last time. Yeah, but you were paid to get to these milestones at this time. You 
your engines don't really light properly. These big, massive engines with this a number of engines on this big rocket don't light properly. They never seem to relight properly. Every single time there's an issue, and they eat themselves. Here's another problem with SpaceX, right? Is that you turn around and say, well, the third launch was better. Imagine the fourth launch and the fifth launch. It's like, hang about. that. The Starship one was empty. It didn't make it to orbital velocity with full tanks. And it carried zero payload. In other words, are we sure this thing can get into orbit carrying itself? Um... We hope so. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Is like the shuttle actually carried stuff into space. The SpaceX, uh, the, the the Starship One, whatever the hell it's called now, it is. It hasn't carried anything, anything, and it still hasn't got into orbit. It, you do realize that it's meant to carry stuff, right? <laughs> minor ones that I can notice from a superficial examination of internet material because I never had anything in my hands. It wouldn't matter if you had it in your hands. You have very little understanding of how most of these things work. And then the other stuff you just make shit up. Uh, the first drawback a little one is that the size of the rotary valve barrel and its proximity to the combustion chamber means that it might be difficult to locate a spark plug right in the center. It might be. No, it is. It's literally impeding it. It's almost like the poppet valve in front of the floor. <laughs> the chamber, as you can see on uh, Vastex, uh, a little CAD drawing. Oh, oh, look at that. Can you see that? So what they've got is, by the look of it, what they've done is they've made this drum and then they've basically made a, like a circular seal or an oval seal with almost like a, a vertical piston ring with a spring in it. Which is a way to do it, although this shape is really going to sod you over. So that's going to be hard to seal. Um, I don't know how they're running any of this without, unless they're just running in plain bearings, uh, in roller ball bearings. Good luck with that. It's going to last great. Uh, when you do these little basic tests, that's fine. But when you're doing actual reliability studies after a hundred thousand cycle, a million cycles, it's probably going to shit itself. Number two is, yeah, the spark plug is in a shit place. When it comes to air-cooled, as you can see this is, we're not really pushing the power output. What the hell is this? The spark plug is... Ah, and someone's gone cab crazy, haven't they? Fillet everything. Make it look pretty with fillets. And it's weird. They've got all this design with the fillets. It looks like the Conrod's clipping into the model. But number two is, they then give up on the piston. And then did the, they, they give up. They obviously run out of time or something. Spark plug is on the... It? Side. It also might be difficult to find space for a direct injector because the barrel takes up a lot of space. Whether this will be true for larger engines, which larger with larger combustion chambers, well, I don't you think about it. You div, it's proportional, right? Like the bigger the engine, the bigger the valve. Like the bigger the bore, you want to try and get more air in it because you're limited by the stupid shape of it. I would have thought we know just something to keep in mind the other small uh, drawback that i noticed and this is from the bsa special ralph watson's car we can see traces of combustion that's not traces that looks like a valve <laughs> that looks like the that looks like an exhaust valve weirdly enough that's not sailing that's um that's not sailing not only that is actually there's a shit mark here that could be, oh, that's probably oil, actually. Sorry, that's probably oil. I don't know about this either, but, yeah, it looks like there's some oil in the system. But we've got some traces here and here. And I think there's a seal. It looks like there's meant to be a seal there. So that's not sealing great, is it, if it's still making it here? Because this isn't oil. That would be, your, you know, your lowest point there across there. So I get that. But this isn't good. Um... No, that's not good, sorry. Maybe this is oil burning, but then that means that the seals are not sealing. So whichever way you look at it, it's not brilliant, is it? You can actually see the top half there. You can see that that's all burnt to buggery as well. So this is the crazy thing, and it's all dark here. And it's actually some metal discoloration, which is one of the problems. One of the things with this is that, oh, um, so you're not sealing oil all the way around it then so you're just accepting that it's like yes we're kind of accepting that and if you think about what i said before about uh valves uh, exhaust valves filling because they're enveloped by heat mm, yeah yeah same thing around on the underside of the valve 
And this is because the rotary valve cavity is not sealed against the combustion it's chamber. It's almost like that's the sealing issue, isn't it? We are only sealing the sides of the barrel. So some of the combustion gas, some of the combustion... It's almost like it needs some apex seals, but we don't want to go down that right avenue, do we? <laughs> ...energy escapes out the chamber and goes into the little tiny space which is around the valve. It is, the... It is, the way to, it, it is one of the ways you could solve it, actually, or help at least is that if you think in the top of your cylinder head right just say just say you're looking you're the piston looking up right you've got this so what you do is you have you have this barrel right this superficial barrel that goes over the top that's twisty twisty we'll do that in orange just say why not a eh? big thick lines like that so what you could do right is and this still is a problem is you could have side seals so a side seal there like that and a side seal there and like the liquid piston so if we look at this from uh, the side let's look at this from the side pr projection right so imagine you've got your, your cylinder head here like this and then you've got this hole so this hole here is this hole here right so what you could do is like a um, liquid piston jobby, what you could do is you could put a apex seal like there and there, if you get what I mean. Um, oops, like rollers almost, like a roller, like a roller seal. But basically, like apex seals there and there, so they would run um, here, like across there and across there. So the green seals could be like piston rings on the drum, oops, on the drum, and then these seals, like you, you, you roll your drum like that, and there's these seals here, apex seals, and then you'd have on the ends, like a wankle, you've got the same kind of problem. So basically you're leaking only this bit, yeah, that's all you're leaking there, which would be fine to be quite honest, that'd be fine, you know what I mean, and uh, that would be all good and gravy. That's the way you could get away with it, um, which might be a, a future project. Who knows? This is a very small volume, but it is still a little loss of energy. And a good, a good material, um, or a possible good material, would be a titanium barrel. For the simple fact is that it has a uh, low thermal conductivity and it can take the temperatures. Maybe you'd have to do a study. And that's a little loss of efficiency. It's probably well, a very a nickel or something, some kind of cool alloy, or three D printed. Very small loss, which is far outweighed if by could survive that. the elimination of valve springs and camshafts and whatnot. But again, something to keep in mind. Uh, there's also a little benefit when you think about camshafts and rotary valves. The rotary valve barrel is just rotating, just like a camshaft. And it's also driven by a timing belt or timing chain, just like a camshaft, which means that we can take a variable valve timing gear and attach it to the rotary valve barrel and get variable valve timing using existing technology very easily. So a nice, convenient little benefit. So I oh, guess- We already do that. That's pretty much it. A, definitely a promising technology um, with its little challenges in terms of sealing. That's not a little challenge. That's like saying the Titanic's only problem is the bloody great big hole in the side of it. <laughs> it's and got sealing out the ocean. The, the timing for it isn't ideal, but it's still, regardless whether oh. it happens in the next decade or two or not, it is still... It literally is the Titanic because the timing wasn't good because it's its maiden voyage. So that if it had done 60 voyages and then sunk, it wouldn't be the focus wouldn't be so heavily on it. But because it's its first biggest ship in the world, its first voyage and it sinks, that's the tragedy of it. It's knowing about because, because it it's sealed properly. It <laughs> serves as a very nice demonstration of the shortcomings of the ubiquitous puppet valve. No, it doesn't at all. Don't get me wrong, puppet valves aren't perfect. But the bloody good. So, that's pretty much it. As always, thanks a lot for watching. I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.
it takes so long. I am. I do apologise. It's a 17 minute video. And it takes so much time to deconstruct. But this is what happens when you talk nonsense. Right? Like, for instance, I'm going to say this. The Holocaust didn't happen. Now, how long would it take for me to say that versus how long it would take someone to do a video to deconstruct that as bollocks? How long would that take? It'd take ages. You know, because your answer is, yes, it did. That's not an argument. To fully go through the evidence and so on and so forth, when I could just say, it's a hoax. You see what I'm saying, right? Is that, you know, you could turn around and say, this place in, this is Auschwitz. This is a place that loads of people go. This is this. These are newspaper clippings. It'd take you forever. Not forever, but it'd take you a long time to go through it, longer than me just to say one sentence. And this is the problem when you say one sentence, because people have said to me, how come it takes you nearly two hours to do a video on a 20-minute video? It's like, because you have to deconstruct all this rubbish. You know what I mean? And, like, for instance, just talking and just showing examples of the Formula One thing. I didn't even read the Formula One document about bishop valves. <laughs> you get what I mean? That would add another half an hour to this whole thing because it's talking about all of the, the aspects and stuff. Because these things are complicated. But it's easy to make a video like this where you just talk nonsense because it's laced with some a few truths here, there and everywhere. And then you get 300,000 views. This video will get 5,000 and then that's it. And all you're doing now is you're just spreading nonsense. Thumbs down for that one. You're just spreading crap. What's one of the top comments say? This man makes me want weird engines in my car. Right. I designed a rotary valve system once for a project and the ceiling was always a headache. I could never get it to last more than a few hours. Bravo to these engineers for solving these issues. They haven't. As a young man, many years ago, I remember ruminating over the limitations of conventional popper valve designs. The idea of interrupting interrupted cylindrical rotor valves exactly like this occurred to me. I remember showing the sketches to an engineer friend of mine. He got very excited and confused about the idea. I'm sure he's not an engineer friend of yours. This was years before the quick Google search was even a thing. When we began to searching patents and technical designs, we realised that the brilliant idea was decades old and virtually thousands of people come up with the variations of this idea. The issue with sealing, expansion, under heat and pressure, and all the technical problems you list in this video are well understood, and my idea wasn't unique or novel at all. For about three days, I thought I might have stumbled on a million pound idea, all tinkerers and idea, all tinkerers and want to be engineers dream of, only to realize that I was left 50 years late to the party. I'd probably add another 50 to that. The idea was that uh, this was an excellent video and watching the excellent animations of the rotary valve idea was like seeing my rough sketches come to life. I hope someone is able to truly make such a drivetrain into reliable real world design. Seeing a B, seeing the BS, uh, BSA, the Birmingham Small Arms uh, V twin engine actually running and racing is delightful. But yeah, it, it's not reliable. It's just it's just the way it is. And that, that guy kind of summed it up. That guy should have done a video, not not drive for answers, driving for answers, uh, or quickly look look up something to do a topic on the internet. On hope that makes sense. This has gone on far too long, and I will see you in a bit.